together. everybody. Great to see you. Uh, good morning to you if you're joining us online. And if you are in from out of town, family visiting here for Thanksgiving, we're so glad you're here and hope you're encouraged by being here. So I just wanted to, um, you know, comment because some of you are seeing only a number on your chair. You're expecting maybe your name on the chair. <laughs> That's not the way we roll at Hope. We don't do that proprietary seating thing. So I would encourage you to switch your seats around with some regularity. And uh, hey, that's how you're going to get to know some new people. So how about Dan dropping a little stealth humor on the <laughs> being jazzed? <clears throat> so we are starting Advent. And Advent is inextricably connected in my mind with songs, with carols, with the music of Christmas, which I really, really love. I love the theology that's in the words of a lot of the Christmas songs. I love the melodies. Many of them you may know are in minor keys, which speak to the longing as we're waiting and expressing our hope to God for the redeeming work that he is bringing in Jesus Christ. You may know that the very first Christmas songs appear in the Gospels, and there really are five main ones. They are from Elizabeth and Mary and Zechariah and the angels and from Simeon. These are really the first five Christmas songs, and they appear to us in the Gospels. I love the poetry and the richness of the lyrics and how they speak to human hearts and, and our human experience and our longing. So like, let's just enter in for a moment to bring our minds in. Think about these words. O oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. Incredible. <clears throat> o come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel, shall come to thee, O Israel. And then this, Grandma got run over <laughs> by a reindeer. Walking home from our house on Christmas Eve. You can say there's no such thing as Santa. But <laughs> But as for me and Grandpa, we believe. This one, this one is particularly moving to me. And it's full of mystery and deep questions. For instance, how did Grandma get run over by a reindeer? And how did Rudolph not see her with his nose so bright? And why was grandma walking home alone? 
a cold, snowy night. And even subsequent verses suggest that she leaned pretty hard into the eggnog that night. And people should have been thinking about her. And then most disturbing of all is that the writer and grandpa seem to have a dark motive that they're actually grateful for this event. <laughs> okay. More meaningfully, truly, truly, the very first Christmas carol. This is from Elizabeth, married to Zechariah, a priest. All of this unfolds in the first couple of chapters of Luke. Elizabeth will be the mother of John the Baptist. Her cousin Mary, of course, will be the mother of Jesus. Mary has been informed that by the Holy Spirit she will conceive and bear a son. And she's told by the angel that her cousin Elizabeth is also expecting and is now just beginning her sixth month. So Mary goes to Elizabeth's home to visit and have some time together. And when Mary arrives, Elizabeth sings this Christmas carol. It may not sound quite the way you think, but hopefully I can help explain why it's such a beautiful Christmas carol. When Mary comes in, Elizabeth says, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. So a little bit more context. In Luke chapter 1, Zechariah is a priest. Zechariah is serving his priestly duties. Commentators say there were approximately 18,000 priests in this era. I didn't know that. I'm like, wow, 18,000 priests. And when they came to the holy moments, there was basically a draw lottery system by which the priests got selected to serve in the most meaningful, most holy expressions of the priesthood. And if you got one of the, quote, most holy ones, of which the lighting of incense was, it was a one and done. This was a once in a lifetime thing because there are 18,000 priests. So if you happen to get a draw for one of the holy moments, it was recorded, and if you happen to draw it again, they go on to the next guy because of the specialness of these moments. This would have been a highest pinnacle moment of Zechariah's career, and he's in the temple burning incense when the angel Gabriel appears to him and says to him, your prayer has been answered. Your wife will conceive a son. And we're told that this son will be great in the sight of the Lord. And he's speaking to Zechariah about John, who we would later call John the Baptist. Okay, that's a little bit of context. <clears throat> this doesn't land easily on modern Western ears, but it is culturally true of the time. Every Jewish woman for generations and generations and generations and generations, as long as anybody can remember in this time at the birth of Christ, had two major identity markers and desires. One of them was that she would be alive when the Messiah came. And two would be that she would be able to have children, particularly a male child. Because this was connected to the lineage, the generations, the perpetuation of family lines. And maybe, maybe, if she had a male child somewhere along the line, the Messiah would be traced in that lineage to her. Okay, so if you're a Jewish woman in that day, these two things were part of your psyche almost, that the Messiah would come in your lifetime and that you could have a child. So with that backdrop, we're getting into this context. Here are Elizabeth and Mary, these two women who are towers of faith, I mean just champions of faith as we see this unfold. All right, Zechariah is a priest. The main, I'll call it, professional prayer of the priest was that 
the priests were praying for the redemption of Israel. This is the ongoing prayer focal point of all the priests, praying for the redemption of Israel, praying for the redemption of Israel. This is his professional prayer. But you know what? He also had a personal prayer. And his personal praying with Elizabeth would certainly have been that they would be able to conceive and have children and maybe even a son. He never would have mixed the two. He would not have brought that personal praying into the temple, particularly at such a holy moment. He would have prayed the prayer for the redemption of Israel, particularly in this holy moment of lighting incense in the temple. But you know what? Like most of us, he's got both professional prayers and personal prayers going on in his life. Like most of us, we're praying for certain things related to work or jobs or how things might go related to employment. We've got professional prayers going on. And most of us have personal prayers going on. Personal prayers for people we love, things that are going on in our own hearts, things that are going on in the lives of others. So Zechariah is in the temple. He's been praying professional and personal prayers. One of the most beautiful lines is when the angel Gabriel comes to Zechariah and he says, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will conceive. Now, you're going to want to ask, wait, my professional prayer or my personal prayer? I just love this part of the story, both. Both, because you're praying for the redemption of Israel, and John the Baptist is going to be an integral player in the redemption of Israel as the Messiah comes on the scene. And you're praying that your wife would conceive. I just think for many of us, we have this sense, hey, I'm praying this over here and I'm praying this over here and God doesn't really know. They got firewalls between them. He doesn't really understand. And sometimes I have to remind him that, you know, they both matter to me. And so the angel says, to Zechariah, your prayer's been answered. He doesn't specify which one, but of course, both of them are answered. It's beautiful. Luke, as a gospel writer, is the artist of the heart. Luke is the artist of the heart as far as his writing is concerned. Luke has more detail, more specifics in his stories than most of the other gospel writers. And you know that the value, the important stuff in a good story is in the details. You've heard it. You've been told a story and you stop. You're like, well, wait, where was he? And wait, what what did she say again? The stories live on the importance of the details. And Luke is very committed to the details in his stories. But this is also really significant that gives us an understanding that they are historically true. The ancient myths don't have details. If you don't have details, you don't have evidence and forensics to research and try to discern if they're true or not. When Luke gives this many stories, these people, these time frames, these places, these leaders, you can do the historical research to determine whether there's veracity to the stories or not. And so Luke is giving us numerous gifts in the way he's rendering these stories, the great gospel writer who is the artist of the heart. He writes about human experience and human hearts with more depth than the other gospel writers. Okay, so if you're familiar with the Bible, you know this. God has this interesting track record of bringing about very unexpected pregnancies and births in the Bible. And this goes all the way back to the beginning of the story. So it should be no mistake that the linkages are showing up here. Because in Genesis 17, Abraham, of course, the father of our faith, married to, at the time, called Sarai, who's then renamed Sarah. Abraham's an old guy. And Sarai, his wife, is an old woman. Way, way, way beyond childbearing time. In Genesis 17, when God had promised that Abraham would be the father of many nations, basically the family of God, God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you're no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings and peoples will come from her. In other words, a remarkable birth and pregnancy is woven into the historic narrative of Israel. And it should be no great surprise to us that remarkable births become back on the scene when we're getting into the redemption of Israel. So Elizabeth is told, 
Zechariah is told, Elizabeth is told that they will conceive. They will conceive a child miraculously naturally. Mary will conceive a child miraculously supernaturally. So they're like, well, wait a minute. Elizabeth and Zechariah, that's like a normal birth. That's not like a miraculous birth. Okay, friends. If you can explain to me how two cells, a sperm and an egg come together and they start multiplying and everything begins to know whether it should become a bone or heart muscle or brain tissue or eye tissue and it all starts moving into the proper place with the exquisite order, it's miraculous. And you say, no, 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 I can explain it. It's biological, I can explain it. Okay, it's biological, you can explain it. Mary's birth, it's theological. I can explain it. The work of God in both of these births is breathtaking. Different, yes. Breathtaking in God's presence in both cases. In the scriptures, there are a handful of occasions where Israel's hope is met in babies. So, I've had a couple of interesting things in my life in the last couple of weeks. We have a nephew who passed away after a valiant leukemia battle. And about simultaneously, some of my longest time, like college friends, two of them are becoming grandfathers. So I've got these two text threads going in my phone. One of them is a robust text thread with family and close friends as we're sharing heart and consolation and encouragement about the death of our nephew, Lucas. And then I got this other text thread that's running simultaneously that's pictures of newborn babies from these good friends of mine. That's life right there. That's so much of the way life works. I think often we tend to look at life and we think, <clears throat> okay, maybe there'll be hard times, but then they'll, quote, go away, and then we'll have good times. And then, yes, maybe some hard times will come. And we expect them somehow to be sequential. But life doesn't usually work like that. They usually come simultaneously. The hard times and the beautiful times are the two rails, and they come simultaneously. And they bring these contrasts and these collisions that are hard for us to get our heads and hearts around. Because there's so much beauty on the one hand, so much hope, and so much sadness and hardship on the other hand. This is life, and this is the kind of world into which our Redeemer comes. So, Zechariah is told, you will have a son, and he will be great in the sight of the Lord. What an interesting little detail, in the sight of the Lord. I mean, it could have just said, he'll be great. Great. He'll be great. Great. Every parent would love to know that their kid's going to be great, but it's not that kind of great. What kind of great is it? It's great in the sight of the Lord. Who you are in the sight of the Lord is who you are. Who you are in the sight of the Lord is who you are. So you're going to have a son who's going to be great. Immediately, most of us would arc to some great professional accomplishments, some great stature, some great leader. He's going to be great. Really, 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 how? In the sight of the Lord. Many of us are longing for greatness in some kind of professional accomplishment or accolades or school and all that kind of stuff. We get it. But it's fiddling around with tiny prayers of identity when we have this invitation from God that in his love, we can be great in his sight. If I could help every one of us understand how deeply God loves us and how this level of stature is everything our hearts are longing for. And all the while we're over here saying, I want to be great at this, I want to be great at that. No, he'd be great in the sight of the Lord. In the sight of the Lord is who we are. So Elizabeth's song, it's born out of hope and waiting and faith and trust and humility. And now we begin to grasp a little bit more. Why does God use this woman, Elizabeth? Why does God use this woman, Mary? These are remarkable women. And Elizabeth's song just comes forth 
out of a heart of hope and waiting and faith and trust and humility. We've said it many times, but waiting isn't really waiting until you've waited far longer than you thought was reasonable. That's when it actually becomes waiting. She and her husband have been waiting for the redemption of Israel. She's been waiting, 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 hoping possibly she could have a child. Born out of the hope and the waiting and the faith and the trust and humility. Waiting for the hope of Israel. Waiting for the birth of a child. And out of this comes the first ever Christmas carol. I was thinking about this. I love the music of Easter. That's beautiful too, but it's quite different. The music of Easter is victorious. The music of Christmas is hopeful. And I think this is one of the reasons I love the music of Christmas so much. It speaks to life as we experience it. It speaks to life in the longing that we have now. The lyrics are soulful. The melodies, the words, they express the weight. Not A-I-T, but E-I-G-H-T that we all feel in life, the two rails, the death of a nephew, the birth of babies, and you have your two rails going too. The weight that comes with life. This weight is expressed even beyond human hearts. The Bible tells us remarkably in a beautiful kind of personifying metaphor that even the entirety of creation is groaning and waiting for the redemption. In Romans 8, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. My brother-in-law, Anderson, spoke at my nephew's funeral, a memorial service, and he made a beautiful distinction, and I noticed this all along in Lucas's leukemia battle. He never complained. There was never a why me, this isn't fair, where is God? There was never any of that. And Anderson said, Lucas never griped, but he did groan. And he went on to describe the difference between griping and groaning. He said he never griped, but he did groan. He groaned under the suffering weight of his experience. Along with all of creation, this is who we are, particularly in the season of Advent, as we wait for redemption. Okay, so I just love Christmas music. I don't listen to it all year long. I mean, that'd be kind of weird. I do stop about mid-June And I give it a rest, and I pick it up again, usually about 4th of July. (laughs) I I really do. I'm serious. I kind of do this, like, in my car. I don't do this in front of people because I think it's so weird. But there is just nothing in Christian music that renders the hope and the longing of our hearts the way Christmas music does. So I grew up in a home that was filled with music. I think we know this in many ways. What you grow up with, you just think it's normal. You just think that's the way life is. And then, of course, you get older and you realize how things play out a bit. But I grew up in a home that was filled with music. My mom had music playing all the time, and she sang all the time. She was always singing in the house. Mom would sing when she was cooking. She would sing when she was doing laundry. She was just always singing. And I didn't think anything of it, but I now see it as a real gift. My mom was just, like, always singing. So we had a memorial service for my mom this year, and my sister Jody and I shared memories of mom. And you know, you think when you grow up with siblings, you know all their stories. You just sort of feel like we all know each other's stories. Well, my sister told a story that I'd never heard before. And she was remembering mom, and she said that she was in the grocery store with mom, and Jody was about 13 years old, and mom was singing in the grocery store, (laughs) loud. Like, people can hear her. Like, two aisles over, they can hear her. And my sister is so embarrassed. And she's, like, trying to get as far away from mom as possible, right? 
Because when you're 13, no matter what your mom does, it's wrong. And so she's so embarrassed. And she's telling the story. I'm just listening. I'm hearing it like everybody else. And she's like, coming up with a plan. When dad gets home tonight, I'm going to have a talk with dad about mom. We got to solve this problem. (laughs) So dad gets home from work. And Jody says, dad, we have to talk. And dad's like, okay, what do we have to talk about? Dad, we have to talk about mom. Okay, what do you want to talk about, mom? Dad, mom, I was in the grocery store with mom today, and she was singing, and people could hear it, and it was so embarrassing, and you have got to talk to mom and tell her to stop doing this. And dad was quiet for a minute. He said, Jody, I think you're going to have to work your way through this. I think you're going to have to realize how fortunate you are to have a mother who's happy enough to sing in the grocery store. Way to go, Dad. (laughs) So what's the essence of Elizabeth's song? This is where it gets so remarkable. The essence is, it is her joy to be the smaller player to Mary's greater blessedness. Elizabeth's song is expressing her great joy being the smaller player to Mary's greater stature in the story. That's not normal. Her expression is overflowing with this joy. And the more I spent time with this, I thought to myself, here's what we've got in our country. We have a joy crisis. We are joyless. And I think Christians are the one to try to begin to turn the tide on this. We have a joy crisis in our country. And Elizabeth's overflowing heart is expressing her joy. And how could that be possible? It's because of her humility. Gary Thomas said, when we slip from the foundation of a giving life to a notice me life, we live in a state of high frustration. Ambition grinds up people. To embrace humility is to be liberated from the insatiable search for self-significance. Let me say it another New Testament way. We can't really know joy until we die to ourselves. And when we die to ourselves, it is now possible for the Holy Spirit, that is God, to begin to take up residence in our lives. And when the Holy Spirit begins to take up residence in our lives, joy will be one of the results. Note in verse 41 in Luke 1, It says, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and then in a loud voice she exclaimed. Don't miss the order of that, and don't think the nod to the Holy Spirit is some incidental point. It's a major point. She's filled with the Holy Spirit, and from that filling of the Spirit comes forth this expression of joy. Thomas goes on to say, while pride is the father of hate and dissension, Humility is the mother of love and unity. Without humility, we become thoroughly disagreeable and demanding characters. You see, jealousy makes joy impossible. And envy makes joy impossible. Theologian Henry Fairley describes envy as our sorrow at another's good. In other words, somebody else has something really great happen to them, And we feel grinding inside because it wasn't us. Because I didn't get that level of stature. I didn't get what they had. Now imagine how much joy we could have if another's good brought us joy. There'd be joy opportunities breaking out in our hearts and lives all over the place. But this requires a certain level of humility. Oscar Wilde once told this story, apparently. It's kind of a parable. The story unfolds like this. The devil was once crossing the desert, and he came upon a spot where a number of small demons were tormenting a monk who was living in the desert. The sainted man easily shook off their evil suggestions. The devil watched them fail at their attempts, and then he stepped forward to show them and give them a lesson. He said to them, what you're doing is too crude. Permit me just one moment with this man. And with that, he whispered to the monk, your brother has just been made the bishop of Alexandria. A scowl of malignant jealousy at once clouded 
the serene face of the hermit. That, said the devil to his imps, is the sort of thing which I should recommend. Sorrow at another's good. Envy at somebody else's happiness. So years ago, we had a ministry <clears throat> that we did, usually in the late winter, and it was with fourth and fifth graders and their parents. We call it Family Matters. And when you registered for this, all the kids put their favorite candy down as part of registration. What's your favorite candy? And like the third week in, they come in and all the kids are sitting in this big circle on the carpeted floor. And every one of them has a little paper bag, like lunch bag, with their name on it. And the parents are all sitting behind them. And the leaders say to all the kids, okay, look in your bag now and don't show it to anybody. Just look in there and see what's in there. Well, in every kid's bag was their favorite candy. So every kid is so pumped, like, yes. What they didn't know is that vastly differing amounts of candy were put in the different bags. So then the instruction is, okay, on the count of three, I want you to dump your bag so everybody can see what everybody's got. And as soon as everybody dumps their bag and everybody can see what everybody else has got, like a riot broke out in the room. Because <laughs> everybody's like, hey! That's not fair. Look what he got. Look what she got. And I only got this. How many? The point the leader said was, well, wait a minute. When you were just looking in your bag, you were so happy. This whole thing headed south once you started looking at what everybody else got. The moral of the story was keep your eye on your own bag. Elizabeth is remarkable in the humility of her expression. Joy makes you grateful? Or is it gratitude that makes you joyful? Gratitude makes you joyful. Or wait, is it joy that makes you grateful? I think you get the point. They're mutually perpetuating. But humility is the essential core of all of it. And so when the Holy Spirit, who is God in the flesh, comes into our lives and becomes real, as he did in Elizabeth's life, the result is that joy wells up in praise. Now look, we're not all going to be like overflowing with happy things every second of our lives. But with the Holy Spirit in us, when we give true thought to Jesus, his life, who he is, what he's given us, joy will well up to praise in us. If the Holy Spirit is in us, it can't be otherwise. The Holy Spirit is an essential player in the entirety of the Christmas narrative and the songs that come from it. Joy is always a mark of the Holy Spirit. Sadhu Singh said, Real joy and peace don't depend on power, kingly wealth, or other material possessions. If this were so, all people of wealth in the world would be happy and contented. But this real and permanent joy is found only in the kingdom of God which is established in the heart when we are born again. So Elizabeth, we're told in the narrative, secluded herself for five months, which you might think is an odd detail in the story. Like she was told that she's going to have a baby, but she goes into seclusion for five months. Mary, when she was in Nazareth, was told that her cousin would have a baby and she's just beginning her sixth month. Mary goes to visit her. Why would Elizabeth go into isolation for five months? I think it's because the baby wouldn't really have been showing. You see, because the story now was making its rounds, that there was a promise that she was going to have a child. But if five months went by and nobody saw any evidence of the promise, she'd be subject to ridicule and like, you're in crazy town. So she keeps to herself for about five months. It seems that the baby would be showing enough that if she went out in public then, the story would be clarified and ratified. And that's when Mary comes to visit with her. You know the story, probably. It's a beautiful picture of these two women who had been very unusually called of use in the redemption of Israel. And when Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, they share testimonies and stories of what their experience has been and what God is doing in their lives. You know what it is? It's the best of Christian community. They're sharing the testimonies and the stories of what God is doing in their lives, which is giving them each comfort and confirmation and courage. See, here's what I think. 
I think on any given Sunday, there are millions and millions of Christians around the world in worship services like this. Like, fingers crossed, hearing the scriptures, singing the songs, and just hoping, hoping, hoping maybe it's true. When Mary goes to be with Elizabeth, the sharing of the testimonies, the truth of their stories, the comfort, the confirmation, and the courage, they mean this. You can uncross your fingers and you can open your heart. So here's a little encouragement. Maybe we could do this. As we move through the weeks of Advent and come to Christmas, write your own song each week, your own song, poem, song, carol, your own expression. Maybe make it a working writing throughout the week. Start it on Monday, come back to it on Tuesday, edit a little more on Wednesday, shape it on Thursday. And maybe by the time we get to Christmas, we would all have our own songbook. If we write our own each week, maybe some beautiful things could happen with it. Let's pray. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. And ransom captive Israel Who mourns in lonely exile here Until the Son of God appear Rejoice 